All right, welcome to Coaching the Guardians of the Heart. I'm Tony Stolzfus, and uh, today we're going to be working at a couple things. I'll pull up the the uh, learning objectives here, but uh, our objectives are we're going to be working again with using the emotional brain. Most of of coach training teaches you to coach in the rational. We're going to be coaching in the emotional, and in the Coaching Deep Transformation webinar, we covered the idea of drilling down to a desire and meeting Jesus there. Well, there's two other places you can go along the way to beliefs or emotional memories. So I want to sort of flesh out the process starts the same, but then there's three different options you can take to desire, to belief, or to emotional memory. And you can use those to accomplish different things as a coach. So we're going to focus on seeing how beliefs and emotional memories protect the heart, and then demonstrate how you coach down through emotion to beliefs or to emotional memories. So that's our objective for today. Um, I want to start with a little bit of review just to bring you up to speed on the heart model and the idea of following emotion. So this is the heart model that we use. Uh, it's based on the idea biblically that action is the product of the heart. So out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks basically means what I do comes out of who I am and biblically your heart is everything that goes on inside of you I find it helpful to break that down a little bit so there's three different levels in this heart model up here at the top are is the mind which is the active or the conscious me think of what goes on in my head from moment to moment and that includes thoughts, decisions, and feelings. So the first level of my heart is, is the mind, but underneath that the research is, and I think experience would show that a lot of what goes on in your conscious mind comes from deeper within us. And there's this level of identity which is my beliefs, my wounds, my memories, my values, my vows. It's, it's sort of what life has taught me or who I've become in the process of living. So think of this as the nurture part of you, um, what you've become in life. Well, one quick note, this is a change model of the heart, so you won't see something in here like personality type, because you don't set a coaching goal to change your personality type. <laughs> so we're just, we're not treating that part of who we are. So we have action, the product of the heart, our mind, under that our identity, and underneath that is the level of desire. And desires are things like love, acceptance, belonging, challenge, justice, freedom. They're, it's the stuff that we want that's deeply rooted within us. And much of our action is designed to give us our desires. And what we teach in Leadership Metaformation is how to help people detach their hearts from the things in this world that they think will give them their desire and get their desires met with Jesus. And when that happens, changing in the identity and the mind and the action realm becomes much easier because I'm full on the inside and I'm not battling this urge in me to get my needs met. So that's the sort of model we're working from. Um, a little bit of brain science here. There's three portions of our brain, we're mainly going to be concerned with two of them. Uh, we have an emotional brain and a rational brain. And they're two different sections of the brain, two different sets of cells. They function in two different ways. Now again, most of your coach training probably taught you to coach on the rational side. So you learn how to set goals, and explore options, and create action plans. Those are nice, linear, rational processes. What we're going to do is learn how to also coach on the emotional side of the brain. And the way the emotional brain works is it takes your current experience and it looks for a similar experience in the past. And then when it finds one, it gives you the same emotions that you had in that past experience. So we can use that the way that your emotional brain connects things to bypass some of the filters in your rational brain that, that stop you when you try to figure out why you do what you do. And this emotional brain leap will bypass that. So that's the process that we're interested in. So 
And the subject of this webinar is the idea of the two guardians. There's two sort of key defenses that all of us use to protect ourselves. And we're protecting ourselves from unmet desire. Uh, so you see desire down there in the middle. But if a situation occurs where I feel threatened or I feel an emptiness inside, my two guardians spring into action. And the first one is the emotional memory, the guy in the red shirt on the right. And what he does is, if, if I'm in a situation that looks threatening, he goes back and finds a similar memory, and then he gives me that same emotion. And that emotion makes me react and respond in a certain way to what happened. And those reactions are meant to protect me. So for instance, if I see a big scary dog, <laughs> My emotional memory goes back and says, big animals are scary. Let me give you this feeling. And you feel that. And then you know to run or to jump in the car and lock the door, or whatever it might be. But that emotion gets you to act quickly. So that's one way we protect ourselves. And the same mechanism that we use to protect ourselves from physical danger, we use in conflict situations or in marriages or in all kinds of other situations and sometimes those defenses don't work out so well for us so we're going to be focused on how we change that the other guardian of the heart is my beliefs and think of your beliefs like these little pre-made scripts when that big dog comes out um, I immediately feel fear because my emotional memory serves that up and then my belief says the way you need to deal with this dog is something. It may be that you run. It may be that you climb a tree. It may be that you make yourself big and try to scare it off. Um, whatever it is, we have these pre-made scripts that come from past experiences. And when the pressure's on, our, our identity serves up those beliefs, and that sort of determines how we respond under threat. And these mechanisms are deeply rooted in us. So when people are trying to change, or when people are trying to see a blind spot, you'll find a lot of resistance when you coach them when you hit these mechanisms. So we're going to look at how they how we work with them. So let's start with an example. Um, let's say that a person's in a conflict. And uh, so this person grew up in a situation where their parents were arguing all the time and they were talking about leaving each other and threatening in different ways and so what happens even though this person's 35 now um, or even if they're 65 and their parents are long dead um, when they get in a conflict situation the emotional brain goes back to those memories and says this is the way I want to respond emotionally and then you get a powerful emotional reaction so when you see people get a stimulus of 2 and have a response of 10, <laughs> you know, where the response is all out of proportion with the stimulus, that's often your emotional memory at work. Um, so the first thing that happens to this person in conflict is they get this emotion from their past, and it tells them to respond in a certain way. So they may feel a fear of loss of connection, even if the person they're in conflict with, they're not that deeply connected with. But since that was what they felt in the past in conflict, they feel it now. And they respond out of that fear of loss of connection. Maybe what they do is they try to placate the person or they try to make the argument go away by being nice. But there's a strategy in there um, that came out of their belief system. Way back with their parents, they learned um, when mom or dad are fighting, maybe I can do something nice that will make them forget about it. And then everything will be happy again. And I'll get my desire, which is the objective of all this stuff. And maybe the desire is for connection or the desire is for peace. But um, this little strategy I do where I try to placate and make nice, and give little gifts and help everybody, that's a strategy that I learned maybe as a child. And I immediately deploy without even thinking about it when I'm in a conflict situation. So that's a good example of a guardian. Let me give you another one on this video. Let me uh, 
Um, I just wanted to buffer a little bit for you. Um, this guy in the video, this is fun. He's a white supremacist. If you follow the news about a year ago, he was trying to buy this little town in North Dakota and invite all his white supremacist friends to live with him. <clears throat> so anyway, he at one point went on this TV show and agreed to have a DNA test done. So what they're doing in the video is they're revealing the results of the DNA test, which are quite surprising to him. So you'll get to see him respond to this. And there's a couple things I want you to look for. The first one is, how does he react out of his emotions? We don't know what emotional memory he's responding to, but in that first half second after he hears his report, you'll see him respond emotionally. So look for that and tell me what his emotional reaction is. And then the second question is, once his rational, you'll see his rational kick in and start to defend himself. There's an opportunity in this for truth to come and penetrate his shell, but his defenses go up so quickly, and he goes back to these old scripts that he's used over and over again, and they protect him from changing. So watch for that in this video and, and see if you can identify what are the emotions and what are the belief scripts that he's operating out of. So here we go. Oop, let me turn my volume down so you don't hear it twice. Okay. Craig Cobb. Mm -hmm. Craig Paul Cobb has undergone DNA testing to determine genetic ancestry. 86% European and... Uh, <laughs> Give it to him. Give it to him. Fourteen percent sub-Saharan African. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey. Hold on. Just wait a minute. Hey. So. This is called statistical noise. Sweetheart, you have a little black in you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Listen, I'll tell you this: oil and water don't mix. So, hey, bro. <laughs> <laughs> what fun we're having. It's a Craig Cobb. All right, I'm going to let this buffer a little bit, and, we'll, and I'm going to show it to you again. But uh, we'll especially watch that first little half second after he um, hears that he's 14% black. And you'll see an interesting little reaction, and then his rational will rise up, and his defenses will come in and cover it up. So watch for that little moment, and then tell me afterward, where does he go to? What scripts does he go to to defend himself? Craig Paul Cobb has undergone DNA testing to determine genetic ancestry. 86% European, and... Uh, <laughs> Give it to him. Give Four, it to him. Fourteen percent sub-Saharan African. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Just wait a minute. Hey, so. This is called statistical noise. Sweetheart, you have a little black in you. Yes. Uh, Listen, I'll tell you this. Oil and water don't mix. So, hey, bro. <laughs> The lady in red is having such a great time with this. <laughs> I like her. <clears throat> so, first the emotions. What what was the emotional reaction that you saw? Um, type in what you saw there. Go. In that first little half second, what emotions did you see and how did he respond out of his emotion? Mm -hmm. 
So there's no way, there's disbelief. So his first response is sort of a surprise, a little shock, embarrassment. He turns his head away, so he's not looking. He recoils physically. So his, his posture, when, when he's anticipating the results, he's leaning in and looking at her. When he hears the results and it hits him, he recoils and looks away. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's embarrassed, he's disbelieving, he's shocked. Um, so his emotional memory is serving up a, a response here. Oh my gosh. Now, the belief part is really interesting. What, what little belief scripts does he go to? Type in what you saw there. What were the long-held beliefs or standard little things that he goes to? And there's body language things as well as as uh, verbal things. I just like that video. When this, after spending some time in a mental institution and um, being charged for harassing his neighbors, I think he's now on the way out of this community. Okay, good. So, so one of his first responses is denial. Um, so when I'm confronted with a fact that doesn't fit my beliefs, my beliefs don't change, the facts do. <laughs> so no, 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 this isn't right. Um, so he immediately goes to the phrase there was statistical noise, um, which is not a very convincing argument, but that's one of the interesting things about this kind of beliefs is they weren't formed rationally, they were formed emotionally. So even though that's a total weak piece argument, um, he believes it <laughs> um, because it reinforces and defends his desire and his identity. So it's just statistical noise. Then he goes to the oil and water don't mix thing. And that goes back to another one of those scripts. Oil and water don't mix. This can't be true. Um, did anybody notice any of the the body language things he did to express denial? What did he do there? Yeah, he believes the facts don't apply. And, then, and afterward that they had somehow manipulated the test just to embarrass him. Again, that's my my belief saying I'm right, so the facts must be wrong. So any kind of explanation we can come up with is going to work for me. It may not work for anybody else, but it makes me feel good and defends my desire. What did you see him doing? of your typing. So he recoiled physically, you know, when when she went to fist bump him, you know, he, he took his hand away. <laughs> he wouldn't let her do it. So there's a, a physical sort of denial. Um, the other thing that he does is there's this smile and laughter that comes across his face. And it's sort of like, Oh yeah, here we go again. I'm right, and you're you know it, it's a it's the smile we use when someone else just doesn't get it. Um, so for this guy, just just to sum up here, his emotional reaction was shock and disbelief. It caused him to recoil physically and and try to get out of the situation, and then his rational brain kicked in. And it went back to some old scripts. This is just statistical noise. Um, oil and water don't mix. And, and those beliefs let him, defended him against the truth, defended him against change. Uh, so as a coach, 
what we want to do is if, if we can help people figure out what those mechanisms are that they react out of without thinking, if we can get those mechanisms down or disable some of them, then there's far more openness to change than there was when, when I'm immediately defending myself. So um, let's do one more little exercise just to, um, just to feel this in yourself. And uh, what I want to have you do is think of a recent conflict situation that you've been in. So it can be big or small with family, with, um, with your employer, um, a peer, someone at church, just any kind of conflict. And get a particular situation in mind. And it's important that you have a particular situation because we're going to do the visualization and emotion thing. And if you don't have a situation, you can't do that. Um, this is one of the characteristics of working with emotions is you can't work with a summary of a bunch of situations. You know, in conflict, I usually respond like, we need an actual situation that you can visualize and feel a feeling out of the experience. So um, get a conflict situation. So, And our starting point is going to be the emotion. So identify what's a feeling I had during this conflict. When the person said such and such, I felt this. When I got the email, I felt. When they did such and such, I felt. So, so identify a feeling. And then what we want to do is visualize the situation. So don't just identify the feeling, feel it. And you feel it by putting yourself back into the situation and envisioning it. So take a minute and just do that. And now there's two things we can do with that when we're in that feeling. And this is on the PowerPoint. One thing we can do on the right is say, as you're in that feeling, what other memories does it connect you with? And just be in the feeling and soak in it a little bit and let your emotional memory jump to connections. And often what will happen is your memory will take you back to something that you experienced in the past. I was when I was doing a demo in the previous section. I'm I'm describing his emotion and helping him experience it, and it's connecting me with memories that I had of that. <laughs> so if we if we identify this previous experience that may be the one that the feeling comes from. So we can change the feeling I experience in conflict by going back to this prior experience and working with that. So that's one thing we can do. The other thing we can do is say, so in this conflict, you're feeling the feeling. You're visualizing that moment in the conflict. And then you say, OK, how did you want to respond to the feeling? And very often, the way we respond is sort of filtered by the mind. So we want to have people go back and say, how do you want to respond to the feeling? Well, I wanted to strangle him. <laughs> or now that came up at a coaching session recently. <laughs> Um, I did another one where the person said, I want to kick over a chair. So I let him kick over a chair. It was great. Um, <laughs> so then here's the kind of response that I had. Now I switch over to the rational and say, why? Why did you want to respond that way? And I can also do that with the filter. If you filtered yourself and, and you wanted to strangle the person, but you pulled back and said, no, I'm, I'm going to be a good Christian and not do that. Then I'm going to say, why? Why did you filter yourself? Well, because good Christians don't get angry. And there you just made a belief statement. Good Christians don't get angry. Um, so I'm going to go down to those questions on the bottom row. Where did you learn that? Which is about the original experience. And then we're going to evaluate that belief. How's it serving you? Is it working in this situation? Um, and often what I'll do there is actually take them back to Jesus and say, so tell Jesus your belief and ask him what he thinks of it. But beliefs change when you have an experience of truth. So as a coach, we if we want the belief to change, we have to create an experience where they touch truth. 
And you quoting scripture at them doesn't qualify. <laughs> if I want to take them to scripture, I'll say, okay, so the belief you stated was, um, I'll take one of mine. If the relationship's broken, then something's wrong with me. What I'll say to him instead of quoting the scripture is, so, can you think of, of any passages in scripture that would speak to that belief? Because I want them to have the Holy Spirit speak to them and them to come up with the answer. So, um, let me stop for a minute. I'm going to do a demo here, but I want to give you a chance. What questions do you... Oh, that was you, Emily. <laughs> with the strangle him comment. <laughs> she was at my workshop the other day. Um, so, what questions do you have about this so far? Is there anything you want me to clarify? Um, is there a part of this you want me to expand on? What would you want to know? And what would you want to ask me? So, everybody type if you've got a question. And if nobody has a question, I'll just move on. But as a coach, I'm trained to sit here quietly and wait for you to think. So I can do that. Emily says she feels better now after wanting to strangle the person. That's good. <laughs> what would you like to know about this process? You always deal with both beliefs and emotional memory. Um, oftentimes what will happen is I'll take the first part of this process where we identify an emotion and then we experience it, and, and I ask for a response, and I'll decide which where I'm going based on what's happening with them. So you can take this either to emotional memory, to belief, or to desire. That's what we did in the Coaching Deep Transformation webinar. But I'm going to be watching them and seeing which of those three areas seems the most profitable or is driving them or whatever, and then I'll go there. Um, there's some situations where you really only have to go to one of those places. Um, if you're dealing with a big issue that you want to create behavior change out of, usually what I do is I'll go into the heart through the emotional side of the brain, then I'll come back out through the rational side and make an action plan that touches each level of the heart. So we'll have a plan to fill their desire, and a plan for them to experience truth in their identity, and a plan for them to work out practical change with discipline. So we'll touch different areas. So when a person keeps not having words for emotion, what are some questions to ask? Two things I'll do. One is I have a sheet with a bunch of emotion words, and I have the desire cards which have a bunch of emotion words on them. So it usually helps people to have some physical thing in front of them with a set of words on where they can pick some words off the page. So those are really helpful aids. If we're doing it over the phone and I don't have access to the aids, often what I'll do is I'll have some sense of what they might be feeling. Um, so I'll say, so are you maybe frustrated, sad, grieved, um, disappointed, tired? And I'll give them five or six words and then let them pick. And I never want to give them one word because then I'm putting words in their mouth. But if I give them multiple choice, then they can choose the one that suits them. You're going to ask, what if the client doesn't come up with the right answer from Jesus? Um, when you start doing this kind of stuff, often people will default to the rational. So you'll say, ask Jesus, um, what do you, here's what I believe, what do you say? And what they'll do is they won't even pray. They'll say, well, you know what the Bible says is such and such. And the way I respond is, your beliefs won't change from knowing the Bible. They change when you have an experience of the truth. So we need to get a rhema from God. I want You're going to actually hear him speak to you in this moment. So I, often I have to explain that, that you're supposed to pray and hear. And sometimes there'll be a 
but I can't, or they'll look at me like, what are you thinking? But I've had many occasions where people are like, yeah, right, God's going to speak to me. And then in 30 seconds they hear something. <laughs> so that's sort of the first step. There are some times when people have a really hard time hearing. Um, how you frame the question will usually help in terms of hearing an unbiblical answer. Like if I have someone who's a solid Christian, I'll give them much broader things to ask. If I have somebody who's a brand new Christian, if you do a question like, Jesus, what do you love about me? You're much more likely to get a true answer than if you ask, Jesus, do you love me? Um, and I think there's a principle behind that of praying in faith and praying out of the revelation that you have, as opposed to asking a question that assumes that you have no faith and no revelation. <laughs> so the, the Questions for Jesus book has some rules of thumb to help you construct prayers that will um, help with that. Jürgen, if you want to ask more about that, feel free if I haven't quite covered your question. Is there anything else you guys want to know before we move on? Well, let me get, uh, you're going to keep typing. Let me get Ken up here, and we'll get set up for doing the demo. And uh, hang on just a second. Ken, do you want to, let me push this over a little more. Tell them a little bit about you. Everybody. Um, I live here in Reading as of three months ago, and my wife and I live here, and um, have three adult children, and I, my ministry is to orphans in Mexico. We're actually building a brand new children's home down there. Great. Take volunteers down. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take the process there on the PowerPoint, and I'll have him go into a feeling, and then we'll decide which side of that I'm going to go down first based on his response. But then once we go down that one side, I'll come back and do the other, so you'll see both processes. Uh, and what I want you to look for is just see if you can track what I'm doing on that diagram. Um, but then also keep track of what's the impact of this, and, and why would you do this in your own coaching? Where and why would you use this? So, what do you want to talk about? Uh, I want to talk about an issue I have with anger. Okay. So, pick uh, anger about what? Uh, I me? <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, being mechanically inclined and would rather fix it myself, and I usually do. Built a lot of houses, worked on a lot of cars, um, all these kind of things over the years. And so a lot of when something needs to be repaired or installed, I will do it. And when things don't go exactly how I know they should go, uh, I get mad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That never happens to any of the rest of us. So, so yeah, I'm weird. Yeah. <laughs> so what's a, can you think of a recent time where... That happened. Yeah. So, so tell me just quick about that situation. Uh, this morning, <laughs> <laughs> I was I was putting in a retractable screen door on a pair of French doors, and uh, what should have been a good half hour project turned into a couple of hours of of uh, getting creative and replacing parts that snapped and things like that. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you're a hour, an hour and a half into it. This is taking far longer than it ought to. Things are breaking that shouldn't break. What are you feeling in that? I'm beginning to get really frustrated. Okay. And describe frustration. Oh, some choice words. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, feeling like, you know, things could have been so much easier and, and just really starting to boil. Mm -hmm. So are you are you doing a rant? Do you want to throw things? Do you how do you uh, want to respond to this? I want to throw things so there's just more things to fix. <laughs> so um, but yeah, just verbally let it out. Okay. 
So the response that you tend to make to that is to let it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and then call catch myself catching myself uh, doing stupid things as well, and it's like then I'm mad at myself for knowing better and not stupid things like using those words you mean or well. <laughs> Um, well, that and, and and some of it could have been avoided had I caught that earlier, that kind of thing. Does that make that. sense? Well, you know, doing something wrong in the process okay. of, of uh, for instance, there was a clip that, specifically there was a, a couple of clips that were meant to hold this this rolled screen in place and I needed to take it off to redo something, and in the process, <laughs> the clips snapped into two pieces, and they were useless at that point. So that was okay. That was a good one. So let's let's go down the belief side here first. So the the whole thing with the clips. Mm -hmm. um, how good were the directions for this? Were they decent? They were, were they decent. Translated they were, from no, Chinese. No, they weren't interpolated. They were they were decent. They were uh, they were uh, pretty straightforward. Okay. So was the problem? How how did you end up not doing the things in the right order? Was that um, reading the directions, or was no, that you know, misinterpreting I, I did them? I sit or? down and read through them um, because I'm trying to avoid the whole situation or get angry, but. Um, I think it came about as between things that just didn't want to fit in the opening and knowing that you were special order and, and what I got was what I had and, okay. and dealing with that and then having to adjust a little bit. It sounds like the mission field, but, um, <laughs> uh, but, and then when they snapped, it was like, So in the in the situation that you're in, there's different kinds of blame that people could assign. Mm -hmm. Some people might blame the person who wrote the instructions. Some people might blame the designer or blame the person who built the house before them. <laughs> um, it sounds like you you chose to get frustrated at yourself. Um, yeah, I think I did. So why did you, why did you make that choice? Hmm. Um, well, first of all, because I was the only one there, <laughs> and, and yelling at a screen door doesn't really make any sense. But um, but not being willing to go and you know if it was the fault of whoever cut these to fit and didn't do it wasn't willing to go and, and go through all that again but but I think there's a, there's knowing that seeing all understood it was like I understood what I saw and and then getting myself in a situation where the clips broke was that's when it, it even heightened how I felt about you know, I was angry about right. not being able to do this. So what do you believe about doing things like this that causes you to get angry when you aren't able to do them? Hmm. About the anger or about being able to do well, it? Like, for instance, do you believe I ought to be able to do this and therefore I get angry when it doesn't happen? You believe this ought to take a half an hour, and it takes two. What What's the belief that's getting you in trouble? I I think you said it well. I think I think the belief that this is something I can do and it's not happening. Okay. Um. So now this is I'm going to do something unanticipated here, but um. So if you can do things well, what does it give you? Well, there's satisfaction in that. Um, satisfaction, like 
what does satisfaction give you? I think it gets down to I want to say significance, but I'm not sure if that fit. Do you feel, and some options there, do you feel valuable when you can do it? Do you feel confident? Do you feel um, like you're worthwhile as a person or a resource? Is there another nuance there? Yeah, I think I think the word confident hit a, hit a chord there. Okay. And if you feel confident, what does that give you? Good? Are you acceptable? Are you approved? What's under confidence? Um, this is where the desire cards get helpful. Yeah, they do. Um, I think it's. There's, there's value in. Definitely. Okay. So just to, to note here, so the desire is for value. The belief def defends the desire. So I tell myself I ought to be able to do this because that's what it means to me to be valuable. Then if I can't do this, I feel not valuable and I get angry. Um, so, so talk about where did you learn that, that being Confident gives you value. Where's the belief there come from? Hmm. Well, you take it through school. You take it. I mean, growing up with a dad who had a, his own business and and. So it goes all the way back, mm -hmm. back to I want to be approved, I guess, by uh, by my dad too. Okay. So let's. So what I'm going to do here is just do a little praying into this and see what Jesus says. And and you never know when you do this. You might have a great revelation and it might go nowhere. But this is what you do as a coach. So. Um, so the idea that that um, value comes from confidence, and that if I can't do it, then I'm not as valuable as I thought I was. Take a minute and just tell Jesus what you believe there, and ask him if he wants you to keep that, or if he has something different. He said, he said, is a son, he said, a son is a son is a son. Yeah. And that's a, that's a being, that's not a doing at all. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean in the context of fixing the screen door? Part of it is it doesn't even matter if it gets in right. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't matter. Okay. Can can is that the put put it in the form of a belief statement and mm -hmm. since the
the belief was about value. Mm -hmm. Can you can you make a belief statement that tells you where your value comes from in that kind of situation? Yeah. Yeah, my my value I'm valuable to to Jesus. Not by anything I do. Just because of who he created me to be, mm -hmm. and in the context of a screen door. <laughs> wow, to be able to celebrate to be able to celebrate who I am, mm -hmm. even though it's fallen into pieces. So how does how does that what he said impact you? Does that shift something inside? Does it? Yeah. Um, there's there's definitely more peace in there, a lot more. Good. Excellent. So that was going down the belief side, and we took a little detour down to the desire to get value, and that helped us reconstruct a belief that was. the belief he got from Jesus came back to value, but in a different way. So let's just go down the emotional memory side quick for a, a demonstration. So go back to the feeling of frustration about mm -hmm. the screen door. Mm -hmm. It's not fitting. Mm -hmm. The opening is the wrong size or skewed or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, when you're in that emotion of frustration, what other memories well up with that same feeling? In other situations, like yeah, are there other experiences where you felt frustrated? And let your think with your gut. I mean, that's the way I operated a lot. I mean, there's it's like a huge pile. <laughs> Is there one that sticks out, or an early one that feels like the first? Well, mm -mm. okay. Okay. And I'm gonna, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna leave that. But if there was a strong connection there, we might explore what's the pain in this previous memory. How are they connected? And then, since the pain he's feeling now, or the frustration he's feeling now, comes from this earlier memory, if we can figure out how to diffuse or heal this memory, then it will change the current situation. But the, the current situation is very difficult to change when it's being powered by this thing back in the background. So that's the value of going to the emotional. Is there anything you want to comment on about that interaction? What was valuable to you or what was insightful for you? Um, yeah, it, there's, you didn't have an agenda in there. And you, you gave me total freedom to go wherever. And that, that gives me and the time to do it, which is very valuable mm -hmm. because it's, for me, as a, when I get in a coaching situation, I, it's hard for me to shut it off. <laughs> and I really appreciate it when you did that. Thanks. Thanks. You bet. All right. So let's uh, take a few minutes yet and debrief on that. And uh, I'll make some comments. But what what questions do you have and what observations do you have about this whole process, particularly we spent most of our time going down the belief side. What did you see or what did you want to ask about there? And uh, I'll talk a little bit while you're typing. We started with, with how did you respond? You know, the response was to get angry or frustrated. 
Um, and then the question was, why do you respond that way? And the why gets, it, it kicks the person from the emotional side over to the rational, but it gets them thinking about rationales or beliefs. Um, I'm trying to think what his first response was to the why. Um, eventually that took him back to um, some early stuff in life. Here's a question. Do you find any difference between males and females? Um, males, in general, it's easier for them to get stuck in the rational side, although there are females that can get stuck in the rational, and there are guys that are very good at the emotional side. So, you know, there's sort of a general weight toward one side or the other, but you'll find people in different places, too. Um, if there's anything else. In terms of what's easiest to deal with or strongest, um, I don't know that there's a there, there's a strongest of the two. They're just different. Um, so anyway, we went down the, the Y route. Um, and then what was interesting there is the why seemed to have a desire around it. So I stopped the, the belief process and I went over to a desire process. What does that give you? Which is the desire question. So then we got down to value. And then I came back to, in the belief process, where did you learn that? So that's a good example of how you have little pieces of technique that you interweave depending on the person's responses as opposed to trying to march through a linear process. He said something that got me interested in the desire, so that's what I asked about. Can you talk a little more about the emotional side? Um, yeah, you can go to healing there. One thing I've found is, I used to be a lot more skittish about this, but uh, a lot of times for a person to get healed in a memory, especially if they've been a Christian for a while, you can do a lot in five minutes, and you can do it in a coaching mode just by asking them, you know, ask Jesus, where were you in that memory? How did you want to touch me here? What do you have to say to me about this memory? Did you want this to happen? Or in their simple questions like that. But I think 50, 60, 70% of the healing issues that Christians face can be dealt with really simply. Now, there are big, messy ones that I'm going to send people to an inner healing practitioner for. But there's a lot that you can do with interweaving these different processes of looking at the, the emotional memory, the belief, and the desire. That it, it's easier to do when you're doing them all together than when you try to split it out. So I don't see a big reason for coaches to avoid this area. I think there's a lot of profit that can be had as long as we're able to say, um, you know, here's where I'm getting out of, if you have multiple personality disorder, maybe let's take you to a counselor. <laughs> um, so there's things that are going to get better dealt with in that. But, but most healing issues are, I got hurt by someone in my past or my childhood, often a family member, and I just need to meet Jesus there. And then a lot changes. So I think most of us can do that kind of thing. Others of you, questions or insights from this process? Things that you want me to talk about a little more? What do you want to know if you were going to try, try to go out and do this? All right. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions here. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, and I'll stick around for a few minutes afterward. But this has been Coaching the Guardians of the Heart. Oh, I should mention, too, um, we do have in-depth training on this. Our next workshop is July 28 to 31 here in Reading. You can get more information at the meta-formation.com site. Also, uh, if you're interested in the desire cards or the questions for Jesus book, which has some background on this process, 
Uh, you can see all the stuff that I've mentioned in the call here at coach22.com slash webinar.html. So thanks for joining us today, and uh, I'll stick around for a few minutes afterward.